Hi, everyone, and welcome again to this show about epilepsy and daily life. And today we have a guest with us all the way from the US. Hi, Katie, or uh, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it looks to be a, a nice, shining, uh, brightening day over in, in Oregon. How, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Hagna. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a beautiful day here. So, so great. Um, so, Katie, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself um, and, yeah, give us like a, a short introduction to your experience uh, experience with, with epilepsy. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, we'll get started. Uh, um, yeah, my name is Katie. I'm from Oregon. Uh, I was diagnosed with a juvenile myoclonic epilepsy at the age of 12. Um, I have been living with uh, tonic clonic seizures for uh, 25 years. Um, I have just recently, as of 2017, three years ago, um, had the VNS stimulator um, implant done. Um, I am still uncontrolled with my tonic clonic seizures. Um, I'm on multiple medicines. I've tried multiple medicines. And living a uh, daily life with tonic clonic seizures has kind of been tricky. Um, in my youth, um, I would say late teens to all through my 20s, it was a lot easier. Um, I would go years, um, maybe two years without a seizure. And as I age, I'm starting to have um, more seizures, um, almost about once a month. So um, tonic-clonic seizures, for those that um, aren't very familiar with tonic-clonic, um, they're also referred to as grand mal seizures, where um, I completely um, lose consciousness and fall. If I'm standing, um, I have the ability to um, hurt myself pretty bad or all of us that suffer from tonic clonics um, if we are in the wrong place at the wrong time when we fall. And so um, we usually have a jerking motion um, or a very tense clenching of the, the body during our seizures. And um, once they're over, it can take uh, about five to 20 minutes before um, I'm coherent enough to really realize what day it is and what has happened. Um, and then basically I have, you know, if I have any bodily injury, those are painful, usually oral injury, tongue bites, cheek bites. Um, so I can't eat for the, usually the remainder of the day. Um, and then I typically sleep um, for about 12 hours after a seizure. Yeah. Um, so it's really, um, yeah, draining your energy because obviously it's a very convulsive seizure where your whole body is, is yeah, moving and shaking. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, the nice thing with that is there's typically a pattern with your seizures. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, my VNS is going off right now. So um, you can hear my voice changing there, and that's actually my VNS. So um, just one second. Um, <clears throat> with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, I would have seizures upon awakening. And um, that's, that's actually a really nice pattern to have and to know. Um, but again, as I've aged, um, I don't typically have them. I, I, that pattern has kind of morphed a little bit to um, I don't always have them within an hour of waking. So, um, but usually with juvenile myoclonic epilepsy you have it and you can be taking a nap in the middle of the day and wake up from your nap and be susceptible to a seizure with um with the juvenile myoclonic epilepsy because it is upon awakening so 
So you've been you've been living with with this for 25 years, but obviously there has been changes throughout those years. And can you maybe tell us a bit, little bit about, yeah, your younger years and your youth and how how dealing with epilepsy was back then? Yeah. So when I was younger, I would have to say that um, I, I was diagnosed at 12. Um, a lot of what we found out over the 25 year span is um, hormones play a big role in my seizures. Um, so when I was young and I, I really didn't, I wouldn't say have such an issue with them because I knew that they would happen in the morning. And um, I could really live a very n normal, quote unquote, life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I went to college, a four-year university over here, married, um, had a child, um, healthy pregnancy, um, wow. textbook Fantastic. pregnancy. And, um, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah. It, it was really actually until after I had my kid that the epilepsy has kind of morphed into um, more recent, like where I have them like once a month. But um, when I was younger and in the 20s and maybe even 25 to 30, uh, I, I I really could go long periods of time without having having a seizure and and really understanding your triggers. I would have to say is something that you um, really have to be aware of. And so getting plenty of rest, trying to avoid stress, alcohol, um, those types of things. If you understand your triggers, then you can really do a better job in managing your epilepsy on top of medications. Yeah, that's indeed very, very, very important. Um, you mentioned that you have had um yeah, an operation including a VNS. Could you maybe explain to our community what what VNS is and, and what it entails uh, having having one? Yeah. Um, so, uh, like I said, I'm uncontrolled um, during this 25 years, and so kind of as a last ditch effort, they um, do what's called a vagus nerve stimulator. Um, I, layman's term, kind of call it a um, kind of a heart thing for your brain um it basically makes your um neurons trigger um it's always stimulating about every five minutes and in hopes to have your neurons just always you know go from point a to point b like they need to um <clears throat> when so like i said it's always stimulating and there is a uh, battery pack that's implanted into my chest and there's a lead that goes to the vagus nerve, which is at the base of your brain and it's wrapped around the base of the brain. And um, when my heart rate, which is also an indicator of a seizure beginning to happen, when my heart rate increases, severely increases, it will trigger my stimulator to go off. Um, and when my heart rate triggers it to go off, it <clears throat> does an extra, extra intense stimulator just in case it really is a seizure. And then I also have a magnet that I carry around. So if I feel an aura or if I feel just like funny or feel off in any sort of a way, I can swipe a magnet. Um, darn, I wish I had it handy. I could actually show you guys. Um, so I swipe the magnet over the, the part that's in my chest and that will uh, start the stimulation as well. And if I'm in a seizure, um, my husband or anyone around me can swipe the magnet um, in hopes to stop the seizure. So it can really have, um, of course, a big impact if you could avoid those seizures, which obviously could, as you mentioned earlier, lead to you damaging yourself or, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Hurt. Um, so um, 
I'm familiar with you being an Epilepsy Foundation uh, ambassador. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about Epilepsy Foundation uh, of America and yeah, which role such an organization has played for you maybe as an individual, but also for the epilepsy community as a whole uh, over there in the US? So Epilepsy Foundation, I, I believe we're in 45 states over here in the US. Um, we are definitely trying as an ep epilepsy ambassador. I took on the role uh, primarily because uh, I would have to say that in my youth, uh, I did a pretty good job of being in denial about having epilepsy, hiding it, um, not really being open about it. And I, I feel like now as I get older that it needs, the stigma needs to be dropped. One in 26 people live with it. Um, it's much more common than I guess I was aware of um, mm -hmm. back in my youth. And so being an ambassador, I want to ha have a voice for children that are living with it and that are going to grow up with it. I want to be an example for young 20 year olds that you can get married, you can have children, you can be completely normal. And, and I can also tell you being an, an ambassador, safety of seizures and, um, uh, being a voice for epileptics, um, you know, where like safety is a big key, like what to do when someone seizure first aid, spreading seizure awareness. And um, the other thing is, is dropping the stigma. And I would say dropping the stigma is a big thing. And um, my quote is, um, don't let epilepsy dim your shining light. And I would have to say, um, don't ever let epilepsy define you. Don't ever let it be the reason that you're 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 not shining, that you're not spreading love and kindness to everyone that you encounter. Because I think I think that's the most important thing is is if you continue to be yourself and if you don't let epilepsy define you then um, you just, you, anything's possible. Anything is possible that you put your mind to. And um, that's really what being an ambassador has um, driven me to do is just is, is be a voice for people and be a, be a role model. Fantastic. Um, that's really great. Um, talking about that stigma though, um, have you seen like a change in it over the years from maybe when you were first diagnosed and, and I don't know, maybe people put a label on you at that time. Um, do you see any change back until today and how epilepsy is addressed? Um, yeah. By the general public, uh, by teachers, by doctors, etc. as well. Um, I would say, I would say, you know, people still say really, um, you know, really weird, weird things like, do I need to jump on top of you and pin you down? Or do I need to like, stick something in your mouth? Or, you know, people are really still so uneducated. And I think, you know, back from, I don't even know, decades ago, when, you know, epilepsy was kind of like, you were you had bad spirits in your body or something like mm -hmm. that. You know, I, I really, um, I wouldn't say that it's that bad anymore. Um, but I think it's more or less like just people are cruel on the kinds of things that they say as far as like how to take care of you. And so I think that's where really the seizure first aid plays, plays a part in like, you know, no, we're not some demented spirit that's coming out of our body when we're having these seizures. It, it's, we're fine. And we, you know, don't, yeah, that's kind of my 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think that just makes the importance of, of yeah, being an ambassador and, and spreading awareness around this is, is so important. But I also believe, I mean, given the fact that one in 26 will develop epilepsy, I also would think that some, because of the challenge of living with epilepsy, could keep it to themselves. And obviously it can be maybe to protect themselves or it could be because they don't want to, I don't know, um, be a burden for others. Um, yeah. You, yeah, you yeah. told a bit yourself that you, yeah, I don't know. You, I'm not sure if you use the same words, but but can you familiar yourself with, with, with that? Yeah. So I would have to say that that's where what I did is I would, um, you know, not share the the situation that I had with a lot you know a, a lot of my close friends knew that I suffered from epilepsy but you know as I got older through life that wasn't something that I just you know the first thing that I blurted out you know mm -hmm. no it was something that I had to gain trust with that person so when I told them I I knew that we had somewhat of a connection that they weren't just going to be like oh my gosh you're totally like a burden we can't go you know just to let you know if we go do something i might you know ruin the fun and it's um you know and then you know strobing lights and all sorts of, i mean there's just things that we 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 can't really go do you know i i'd love to go to concerts all the time and do that kind of stuff but i'm very light sensitive so i I make it, you know, every once in a while. So yeah, I definitely use the word burden. Um, I hate using the word burden, but it is what it is. Um, you know, thank goodness my family, my friends, they all understand. But, um, you know, the disease hits when it hits. So, you know, it can be a holiday, it can be it could be fun getting ready to go have fun at the park for the day. And, you know, and I, I'm sorry, I can't, or it can just be a routine day where everybody's supposed to be at work and everybody's supposed to be doing their things. And I, unfortunately, as mom, I have to, you know, sleep for 12 hours and can't, I have a headache and I have oral injury, can barely talk, can't eat. Um, you know, exactly it's all these like let's say hidden sides of epilepsy which maybe are as important or even more important or have even a bigger impact than than the seizures themselves the seizures themselves yeah so i i i, I wouldn't say that i'm embarrassed like because i don't really know what's happening when a seizure occurs so I don't know what I sound like I don't know what I look like so I'm not necessarily embarrassed by the seizure I'm embarrassed by the repercussions of the seizure mm -hmm. I'm embarrassed yes that's and yeah and sometimes I do pee my pants um you know I I that's that's I'd say probably the most em embarrassing you know <clears throat> is is that if that's in I mean, it happens. It's part it of happens. It. That, yeah, it is what it is. And luckily, maybe after the few first times, you, you can manage to live with it. And of course, once you have good friends around which have experienced a seizure with you, they, they know what, if not, not, not what to expect, but at least what to do in case it, it would happen. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, finally, maybe as um, a message to our community. So here um, in the Epianter community, there are a lot of families uh, with children with so-called absence seizures that are the silent, difficult to notice seizures. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, they, they then are different from tonic-clonics in the sense that they are so, so difficult to notice. Um, but maybe from your experience with epilepsy, do you have any advice for families with, with newly diagnosed kids or, or what, yeah, what, what kind of hope can you, can you give them, um, on, on what's ahead? You know, I, I honestly 
don't let it define your child. Your child's capable. Your child's more than capable. I think having a great support system in um, parents, in Epi Hunter and the Epilepsy Foundation, getting involved with the Epilepsy Foundation is a great start. Um, there's definitely um, just know that it is a disease that is, um, you know, silent, but by looking and by being your child can do whatever they want to do in life, whatever they ever dream of doing, support it, help them along the way. Um, and, and I would say just don't ever let that be the first thing that you think of when you think of your child. Think of everything else that is, is your child, their kindness, their creativity, their artistic flair, their ability to cook, um, their ability to read, you know, focus on everything else that makes your child and let that epilepsy be that last and final thing that defines them. So therefore they feel like they, they are capable of doing whatever they want to do in this life because they have the support of their family and friends. Wow, that's fantastic. I'm wearing a shirt, but I actually got goosebumps while, while listening to this. I'm sure our families will be very, very uh, thankful for for, uh, for for seeing this and and, and he hearing you out on this. It's um, it's certainly a, a great, great support for them. So thank you so much, Katie, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Um, I wish you just all the best for the for the time ahead. I hope. Everything will be well with you and your family still during COVID and for sure into the future as well. I wish you a fantastic summer. You as well, Hagma. Thank you so much for having me and just love to everyone that's going to watch this and um, chin up and don't let your shining light be dimmed. Just don't shine that light bright on everyone. <laughs>